Private prisons are a billion dollar industry in the United States. Federal, state and local authorities contract with corporations to provide incarceration services. And business is booming. But a recent decision by the U.S. government dealt a blow to the federal private prison system. We begin with this report from CCTV's Jim Spellman. The United States federal government will phase out the use of privately run for-profit prisons over the next few years. A memo from the U.S. Justice Department instructs the Federal Bureau of Prisons to no longer renew contracts with private prisons, saying those facilities simply do not provide the same level of correctional services, programs, and resources. They do not save substantially on costs, and they do not maintain the same level of safety and security. As of 2014, about 2.2 million people were incarcerated in the U.S. The coming changes apply to approximately 22,000 inmates residing in 13 privately run facilities in the Federal Bureau of Prison System. Including state and local jails and prisons, about 130,000 inmates are housed in private institutions. The phase out of federal private prisons will not affect these facilities. The widespread privatization of state prisons began in the 1980s. In 1997, the federal government began outsourcing incarceration as the number of people in prison skyrocketed. I can do it cheaper every day per inmate than the state or the parish can do it every day. And for the facilities that have federal contracts, we have shown, we have proven, we can do it cheaper than the federal prisons can. A 2014 study by Temple University, partially funded by the private prison industry, found that private jails and prisons can operate much cheaper than public prisons, sometimes saving states more than 50 percent. But a recent Justice Department Inspector General report finds that private prisons incurred more safety and security incidents per capita than comparable Bureau of Prisons institutions. Prisoners say the private prison experience can be vastly different than a public prison. Private facility, it don't have field work or a lot of them don't have trades, trade schools. See, but in a state facility, you can take up these trades or uh, you can go work in the field, you go work on the barn, like there's all different types of jobs, but here jobs are limited. Prison reform advocates argue private prisons put profits ahead of what's best for the community, prisoners, and correctional officers. We begin to make criminal justice policies not based on what reduces crime or how do we save taxpayer dollars, but we base criminal justice policy based on what is going to drive the economic engines of the criminal justice system. And now another federal agency, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, is reviewing its use of private prisons to house immigration offenders. That report is due in November and could lead to ICE phasing out its use of those private, for-profit prisons. Jim Spellman, CCTV, Washington. Joining us now in the studio, Christopher Petrella is a lecturer at Bates College and a researcher on race and criminal justice. Also with me in the studio, Hilary Shelton is the director of the Washington Bureau for the NAACP, America's largest civil rights organization. From Florida, Alex Friedman is the managing editor of Prison Legal News. He served time for armed robbery in both state and private prisons. And Arjun Sethi is an adjunct legal professor at Georgetown University and director of law and policy for the Sikh Coalition. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Let's go to Alex in Florida for our first question. Now, Alex, when we look at uh, you know, what's being described here as prison reform, criminal justice reform announced by the White House, so we've got no more federal private prisons, we have uh, no more prison time for defendants uh, who cannot afford bail. How significant are these reforms? Well, they're a good start. Um, anybody who has researched or worked in the criminal justice reform arena for many years knows that there's significant problems um, that confront a very dysfunctional criminal justice system where the emphasis tends to be more on criminal and less on justice. Um, so these, these are certainly uh, nibbling around the edges. As we know, the, the major criminal justice reform initiatives in Congress has somewhat stalled out and we're still waiting on systemic reform to come from Congress. Um, but in the meantime, these are certainly welcome developments. Uh, they are limited, as you noted. Um, the decision to do away with privatized federal prisons will only affect around 14 facilities housing around 22,000 prisoners, which is a very specific demographic of federal prisoners who are non-citizens primarily who uh, face deportation after serving their prison time. Uh, 
Uh, bail reform is also, of course, very important uh, for defendants who are awaiting trial. So these are welcome developments, uh, but again, just the start of what is going to be a very long process if we want comprehensive criminal justice reform. All right, Hillary, what do you think on these reforms? I mean, is this reform process starting at the wrong end? Shouldn't we be looking at the entire criminal justice system that puts so many thousands, millions of people in prison in the first place? Well, I think we should. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying bad things about what's going on now. It's a small step, but it's important that we look at those who are incarcerated for no good reasons. And of course, even the impact beyond the time they spend in prison. But you're absolutely right. We need a full criminal justice system reform. Quite frankly, we haven't had anything like that since the 1960s under Lyndon Johnson. There have been a number of pieces of legislation that will move us ahead to do a very comprehensive assessment of our criminal justice sentence from sentencing ranges all the way through to time in prison and even other alternatives to incarceration are things that should very well be on the table. Christopher, what is your view? Because when we look at the significance of these reforms, private prisons, as we know, make up a very small percentage of the uh, federal prison system, just about 22,000 of 193,000 federal prisoners are affected by this. That's about 11%. So is this in some way window dressing? Is it a PR exercise or is it really significant reform? I think it's significant. I think uh, the, the DOJ uh, policy directive is certainly worthy of, ce uh, worthy of celebration. Um, I think it's also worthy of um, deep skepticism in the sense that it is just the very, very tip of the iceberg. Um, to sort of lend a sort of statistical framework to this, um, the DOJ's more or less realignment policy, right, moving about 22,000 prisoners from uh, federal contract facilities back to public facilities over the course of the next four to five years, really accounts for 1% of the entire carceral right. population throughout the United States. And so what I think is important to remember is not only is it statistically uh, fairly small, um, but really this is a realignment policy, not a population reduction policy. Arjun, would it be fair to say that private prisons can only be profitable if there are prisoners to fill them? Therefore, you know, the motivation to fill these prisons up are not exactly rehabilitation or reform or anything like that. It's to make money. That's exactly right. I mean, I would start by saying the U.S. is home to 4% of the world's total population and 25% of the world's total prison population. For decades, every social ill in America homelessness, mental illness, drug addiction has been met with incarceration. So while this step is important, what we really need to be talking about is decriminalization and reducing prison populations altogether, both from private prisons and public prisons. Andrew, just staying on that point, is there evident, any evidence to show that the people who run these prisons, who own these prisons, who own the biggest number of shares in them, etc., are lobbying uh, not just the National Congress, but even local assemblies, to enact harsher and harsher laws which carry prison sentences so they can fill these prisons. Absolutely. There is very strong evidence that the biggest private prison companies in America spend considerable sums every year lobbying states, lobbying the federal government, because they want to make as much money as possible. Alex, uh, as we mentioned at the outset of the show, you spent six years in prison. Uh, you were in a for-profit prison in Tennessee. You also spent time in a state prison. What were those experiences like, and what were the major differences that you saw? Hmm. Now, that's actually a very common question. I served a total of 10 years, and six of those years are, were at a privately operated facility in Tennessee run by Corrections Corporation of America, the largest for-profit prison firm in the nation. Um, you know, prison is prison, and when you're in a correctional facility, whether it's public or private, you're still in prison. So in many respects, um, the experience that I had and, you know, hundreds of thousands of other prisoners have is not terribly different from being in a public prison. Uh, but the things that I noticed specifically, uh, the differences in being in a private prison, one, there was a great emphasis on cost cutting. Uh, an enormous emphasis on reducing costs in order to generate profit. And that translated into things such as rationing toilet paper, uh, handing out fewer blankets than in state prisons, uh, understaffing the facility, having constant staff turnover because of the low wages that they would pay their staff, and they couldn't retain staff at the facility. So constantly had guards in the training mode coming in and out of the facility. And also using prisoner labor for security-related issues. Uh, and, for example, they would have the inmates string the razor wire on the fences. They had inmates um, 
design a program in the computer lab to track the failures of the motion detectors on the perimeter fences. They gave me the uh, floor plan of the facility so I could design uh, fire evacuation diagrams for the prison. Now, all these things, when you have inmates do them, it saves money because inmate labor is practically free. But those security-related things, typically you don't want prisoners doing them for obvious reasons. But the focus of the private prison was so much on the bottom line, on making profit. They had a sign out front that would have their daily stock price, uh, which they only removed once the stock started going down. Um, but that was the emphasis, that was the focus. It had nothing to do with public safety or providing a public service for the public good. Um, it rather had to do with private profit. All right, so Hillary, we have these private prison operators who will tell us that they can do it more cheaply than the state system. In some cases, as much as 50% uh, less expensive. Uh, but at the same time, as Alex has been pointing out, if safety is sacrificed, if they use fewer guards, for instance, uh, it's, it's not the same. I mean, it's more dangerous, isn't it? Well, not only is it more dangerous, but you're losing programs if you're thinking about what happens when people come out of prison. If you th what is the purpose of incarceration should probably be the first issue on the table. Well, the purpose is hopefully re to uh, actually prepare people to come back into the world. You pay your penance, that is, you spend your time, you pay for the crime you committed, but hopefully when we return you home, you can become a more constructive, contributing member of your communities. That means we need programs in the prisons. We've seen uh, prisons that at one time we provided even an opportunity for higher education. What all the data shows is that the higher your level of educational attainment when you come out of prison, the less likely you are to go back in, if that's your intent. If the idea is profit, then quite frankly, you want that revolving door to continue being that revolving door. So we still need to fix that problem. Chris, you've done a lot of research on the intersection of race and the correction system. What have you found? Yeah, this is a, a great seg because it also deals with the profit motive <clears throat> uh, and ways that companies uh, tend to prevent the erosion of their um, profits. Uh, as a researcher, I can tell you that there's not a single non-industry funded study that I've ever seen that I consider to be methodologically transparent and sound uh, that demonstrates unimpeachably that private prisons save money for taxpayers relative to public um, facilities, if we want to use that, uh, that sort of language. And so part of my research in the past has dealt with that very distinction. Um, and what I found was that private prison companies like CCA and GEO, but specifically CCA, uh, architects their contracts with these public agencies. Right. Um, to prevent them from having to incarcerate the most costly uh, prisoners. That is to say, uh, old, older uh, and or geriatric and or infirmed um, prisoners uh, who will erode the bottom line. So whereas public prison companies don't necessarily have the luxury of choosing who they incarcerate, private prison companies do and therefore makes any cost analysis, or at least cost comparison, uh, very, very difficult. So that's all driven by a profit motive? Uh, in many respects, yes. Uh, public prisons are also driven by a profit motive in some yeah, respects as well, yeah. um, because the way that they're financed through bonding, through bond issues, lease revenue bonds, general obligation bonds, often requires that uh, investment banks bundle uh, package and sell and sometimes buy uh, that debt issuance, which means that so it, which means that even if California builds a public prison, um, financial services industries uh, and industry companies are still making a lot of money, irrespective of whether or not those beds get filled. If the prison gets built, yeah. uh, Goldman Sachs uh, gets a hefty percentage on, on their uh, investment. All right. So, Arjun, we have the White House announcing these uh, reforms. It affects only federal private prisons. What about the state system? Is there any movement among states to change that as well? Very little. Uh, and it's disconcerting. The states uh, have been using private prisons for decades. Furthermore, uh, ICE, Immigration Custom Enforcement, also uses private prisons. Um, so the Obama administration is detaining roughly 300,000 immigrants a year, and the majority of them are placed in private prisons as well. So we need to be revisiting the use of private prisons by states, but also by ICE. Alex, you wanted to say something mm -hmm. there? I'm a, uh, yeah, I wanted to jump in just mm -hmm. for a moment. Yeah. Uh, the slightly rosy side, or, the, or the, the slightly silver lining, is that some states have decided to back off. Uh, Kentucky, 
no longer contracts with private prison companies. Uh, they used to have three private prisons in the state, now they have none, although I believe they're trying to repurpose those facilities. Um, Idaho uh, canceled its contract with CCA after a massive scandal of fraud in an FBI investigation and the company admitting that its employees had falsified staffing records, uh, and CCA no longer has that contract, and so on. So there's, and, and Texas, believe it or not, uh, which is kind of known as the prison state in the nation, has uh, canceled two private prison contracts uh, in the last several years and, and no longer contracts with CCA for those two facilities, although it continues to contract for dozens more. So although, yes, uh, the states are still using private prisons to a large extent, and definitely ICE is still using privatized immigration detention facilities, some states have seen the light, and this predates what the, uh, the Department of Justice found in the Office of the Inspector General report.